You're listening to Raising Anchor, a Rhode Island FC podcast. We're glad you're here. Hello and welcome to Raising Anchor, your podcast and source for all things Rhode Island FC. I'm your host, Matt Entrican, coming to you on Thursday, December 7th. We've got a ton of player signings to go over and what that means for the formations that are soon to come on the pitch. Plus, we have our impressions on the first ever kit reveal event. And to do all of that and more is your favorite and my only co-host, Jason Carey. Jason, how's it going? Doing pretty good, buddy. You know, very busy week. Very busy weekend there's been a lot of stuff going on lately so yeah i mean for you because you somehow and and it's important that we start with this you had a birthday over the weekend I keep getting older no matter <laughs> what i do it's can't stop but i want to preface that you somehow tricked me into giving you an entire weekend of birthday celebrations not a birthday which is something that you know that doesn't happen anymore. You're an, you're an old enough person that you're lucky if people show up just for, you know, a single eating of cake moment. And somehow you tricked me into doing special things and events with you all weekend. I didn't choose the thug life. It chose me. <laughs> Joke's on you because my birthday is tomorrow and I expect the same kind of treatment back. So I'm going to go bigger and better just because I need that and one mentality in my life. So you're going to be broke by the end of the weekend. Always got to one up everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but in honesty, how was your birthday? It was good. I mean, what we saw the new Godzilla movie. We ate a bunch of Mexican food. Can we can we talk about the Godzilla movie for a second? Uh, not to go in depth in the movie itself, but for those of you that don't know Jason and I guess that would be basically everyone on this uh, that listens to this, you're a huge monster movie guy. Um I enjoy kaiju movies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so when this came out, this was a really like fun moment for you. And so for me, trying to do something nice back, I went to go see if this could be played in an IMAX theater because, you know, giant monsters, giant screen. That's not the case. For whatever reason, the only thing that was playing on IMAX this week was Beyonce. And like, I love Beyonce, but I don't know that I need a bigger Beyonce. In my, she's already big enough in everyone's lives. I was a little disappointed that there wasn't giant Godzilla on giant screens. I, I I might I might be the minority here. I don't know, but uh, I was a little I was a little sad. Yeah, I would have loved to see a movie in IMAX, but you know, Beyonce's gonna she's gonna dominate everything she she gets her hands into. I mean, giant Beyonce could probably beat giant Godzilla. Let's let's be <laughs> honest. So, um, no, but it was a it was a great time. And then of course you know we had the kit reveal and uh, and whatnot. And then. I got my first opportunity this week to go try out the new Top Golf, uh, not in Providence, but also not in Cranston, but Rhode Island, Top Golf, Rhode Island. Uh, super, super fun. So for any of you that haven't done it yet or have never experienced a Top Golf, uh, you need to put that on your bucket list for the next year because whether you're bad or great at golf, it's just a, um, it's just a terrific experience. The gamification of it, the just the support staff and the way it makes you feel like it's 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 like the new adult Chuck E. Cheese. I guess I don't know what else to call it. It just it was a fantastic time. Have you ever done a top golf? I have. Yeah, I've I've been to a few. They're a lot of fun, especially as someone who's not particularly great at golf. It it's kind of a uh, fun just kind of hang out, have a few drinks, maybe get some food, and just uh try and whack whack some balls onto the green. You know the way you say that. Just really, it's like you're a professional already. And I'll be honest too. When I went, this was for a, a company event. I thought that the people that aren't weren't good at golf were going to hate it, and they, I think, had the most fun out of it. I, I think the people that could play were getting more embarrassed that their hits were not going as well as possible by the end of the night and a few drinks. So, uh, you know, for all those of you that have never done it and think you wouldn't, I cannot encourage Top Golf more as a thing to do in this state. And I hope Top Golf hears this and uh, gives us lifetime memberships and games whenever we want because it's also not like it's not expensive, but that easily can rack up a, a few dollars in the wallet. So yeah, it's those drinks. That's how they get you. <laughs> but this is not a golf podcast, so we need to we need to move on. And we also need to educate our new family from the event. Um, I don't really have a good place in the show notes, so I just kind of want to start this off now. Uh, one of the people already wrote in and asked, "Hey, I'm, you know, new listener, 
I got your sticker at the event and they were asking like, I, I don't have the ability to go back and listen to all of your episodes, which by the way, episode 20, we're now in the second level of double digits. So we did it. And I really appreciate this person's question because I, we don't expect people to go back and listen. So many of the episodes were just us trying to fish for things to talk about. Um, but for those of you that are just joining the family, we highly encourage that you probably go back and listen to at least episodes two through four, which give the history of the soccer uh, community in the state, the league, um, kind of some of the behind the scenes of what it took to get Rhode Island FC to come about, as well as the major players within the club itself. And then any of the interviews with pundits from the league or people within the organization, highly recommend you go back and get those. So there's probably like maybe six or seven of the 20 that are really worth it. So for those of you that have listened to all 20, Thank you, and we're sorry at the same time, but uh, you know we get better with each one. I think so. I mean, with with podcasts like this, where it's about sports, I know technical our team has not played any sports yet, but you you can always just kind of once you pick it up, just stay current with it. It's not like a story per se. You know, I don't when I when I start listening to sports podcasts, I don't like go back and listen to the old ones per se. Not something you have to do if you want to awesome we appreciate it but you can always just start from here and just uh keep following us every friday love it love it so let's jump into this and get to uh some of the news so big announcements uh from this week first and foremost uh one of the next anchor partners has been revealed with breeze uh airways as our sponsor for the front of the kit which everyone saw at the big reveal Breeze is an interesting choice. I think we had them internally pegged as one of the final four candidates. Uh, we had used them as a mock-up for some of the uh, AI kits that we had thrown together as concepts uh, a few weeks ago just to kind of do something fun for listeners. And so Breeze in a lot of ways makes sense, but I honestly had my money that this was going to be athletic brewing. If you do any kind of due diligence on the the brewing company itself, it has several ties to some of the investors and the people that are doing the work behind the scenes for Rhode Island FC, as well as uh, fortuitous partners. Beer in Rhode Island is, you know, it's it's pretty, it, it's, we have like the most micro breweries and craft breweries and like per capita in the, the circumference of the state. I don't know. There's some fun beer fact there that I don't really remember, but it's kind of one of those ethos things. And and I was just, um, I, I figured it would be athletic. I'm happy that it's Breeze. I'm, I'm really impressed that the organization was able to pull off um, having that kind of company become the front of the sponsor kit. And the reason I'm really proud of that is because, did you know there's only like two? We're, we're now the second club that has an airline as a sponsor in America. Yeah, so I saw that the only other one for soccer being New York City FC. It, I find it interesting because a lot of the big clubs across the world tend to have airline sponsors. So I, I just did not realize there was so few. So it shows our ambition. Yeah, no, I think, <laughs> I mean, it really does. Like this club continues to think outside the box and, and think bigger than maybe what some of its competitors do. It was really interesting too, when you look at the the organization of Breeze itself, and we said this in the post that we made on Twitter, but Breeze, as a, its a mission statement, is to really go into traditionally underserved regional municipalities and airports that are, you know, what what people might call secondary or tertiary cities uh, within the within the country that don't have the same representation from like an international airport perspective. And I I thought that that aligned perfectly because when you look at what the USL is itself, that's exactly the markets that USL is in. It's not in your New York cities. It's not in your Los Angeleses. It's going to be in those markets that are typically something that's not as lucrative for a quote unquote division one or major league sport. And so having that in parallel, it just kind of like reinforces to me the, the point of what this league is trying to accomplish. And I wouldn't be surprised if that also helps with travel accommodations to get direct flights to each of these cities where one of our soccer competitions is, is stood up. I mean, Right now, there's like 15 direct uh, flights that are are coming out of Providence. If the rest of the league has cities that are currently not represented, it would not shock me if Breeze suddenly opens up pathways to these cities uh, just because Rhode Island FC will be traveling there to play. Yeah, combine that with Colette and we can uh, get our whole away day plans oh laid out gosh. for the rest of the year. <laughs> Should we just we need to get sponsored by Breeze now, too. I, I wouldn't mind some free flights, even if it's to places like Omaha, you know, you know, I, I don't care. 
Yeah, I'm down. Tulsa, Oklahoma, watch out, we're coming. Um, but, you know, having said that, uh, just kind of following up on the press release for, for Breeze and for Rhode Island FC, I thought it was really interesting that the president of Breeze, when doing the announcement, said that uh, the airline was going full Ted Lasso and uh, becoming the only nice low-cost carrier. So it was, uh, you know, it, it, I don't know what else to say except that's charming. Um, but it's great to see that, you know, the the company is investing in soccer as a sport and investing in Royal NFC uh, as a brand. I cannot wait to see Chip on the back of the tail wing of a Breeze flight, you know, on like, like that wrap for a plane. So it'll just be an RIFC specific plane. Maybe that's the plane they get to fly when it's not in use serving customers. And then just chip the seal waving off of the tail. Like that's that's the dream right there. Yeah. Combine that with uh, some comedic videos of him trying to make his way down the uh, the aisles of a plane. <laughs> Knocking oh everybody. Gosh. I love it. I love it. Sold. In fact, it couldn't have really been a better press release and a better announcement with the exception of one thing. And I don't blame the club for this, but I do want to talk about it. There was a little bit of a scandal. A little bit. Just a, just a scotch. The uh, someone who was invited to the press release, we we were invited, but we have jobs. We can't go to everything, uh, and we knew the second that it was announced at TF Green, we knew that it was not going to be athletic. It was going to be Breeze. Uh, so that was hard information to sit on to respect the club's wishes. But we knew the kits. We had seen them. We had helped do some of the work behind the scenes for the kits release. And you know, it, it's eleven thirty in the morning, and then all of a sudden the kit you know gets leaked and. I'll tell you, I was torn because the per- the the media person in me wanted to send it out so that we could get the thousands and thousands of clickbaits and like people just checking to see what it was. But the other side of the media person and the partnership that we have with the club was like, you know, we're not going to talk about it. We're going to lock this down. I-, I think we had three or four DMs where it's like, can you confirm this? Can you confirm this? And it's just really frustrating that one person decided to take it upon themselves to send pictures of a press release and and leak what the the organization had spent so much time building up to a, a very personal and intimate moment later that night. So the good news is, is that it was only one of the two kits and there was still a big enough splash and excitement, which we'll cover in a second, um, around the second kit and all the special guests. But it was just like a really deflating moment for me. And I don't know how you felt, but it's like we we could have done the same thing, burned bridges or left a bad taste in our mouth, but it, I, it's not how I wanted the kit to, to break on the internet. Yeah, it's disappointing, but you know, judging by the mood and how everyone was excited at the kit reveal, I think maybe not that many people actually saw it or they kind of just didn't care and were still excited, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, either way, it, it didn't diminish from the event and that, that's what's important. It's just one of those things where I... I hate to see I hate to see someone's hard work culminate in something less than a perfect perfect moment for themselves. So, but yeah, so let's talk about the kit reveal in and of itself. Um what an incredible night. It was probably one of the best times I've ever spent in Rhode Island doing anything, to be honest. It it had energy, it had it had flair, it had just it had everything. It was it was just an incredible experience. So, before we deep dive in, what how would how did you drink all of that in? It was a lot of fun. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um I enjoyed the the fashion show that they did. That was a lot of fun. Meeting a lot of people. We passed out a lot of stickers, um, hanging out with the Defiance guys, meeting lots of people. Like we met some people from was it Soccer Rhode Island? A lot of other a lot of other different people there. Yeah, we met up with many people from different soccer representations, including USSF, uh Goal, Project Goal soccer RI, a couple of the youth academies, uh, to name a few. And then we, um, so we were invited as VIPs, um, which was nice. It was fun. Um, so for people that had attended, there was actually a secondary, uh, location internally inside a barn that's like adjacent to the main, um, hall for, for the guild. And that's where a lot of the investors and, uh, what I'll call soccer dignitaries were hanging out. So yeah, so we were, I, I didn't drink, I only had one beer until after everything was done because it was almost like a business meeting for us as we went around. Yeah, but I tried to keep it professional. You got to keep it professional <laughs> at all times, uh, especially when you don't know who you're like shaking hands with and passing a sticker out to. But no, it was, I agree with you. It was, there was just an unmatched energy and excitement. Like it was really the sum of people waiting for years 
to see something truly tangible, whether that was the kit, it was a player, like an in-person player. Uh, it was just an electric moment. And just then seeing all the other press and media that were there covering it, it felt for the first time like this is real. We, we've known it's real. We've, we've been working behind the scenes, but that felt as real as it has possibly been so far. Yeah, it, it's really nice to see um, like a tangible output for for the thirst for soccer here. You you can see all the comments, likes, you can hear numbers and all the stuff, but to see that many people all like in one spot to be excited for RAFC was a really good feeling. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I can't think of a single negative to take away except for the fact that I was surprised that uh, I, I knew Mike Parkhurst couldn't make it, but I was surprised that Brett Johnson wasn't there given that I had seen him in a press release video not three or four hours earlier at TF Green with with Chip and the and the Breeze announcement, so I was I was a little shocked. I had I had anticipated to to ambush him at some point, seeing that earlier video, and then uh, I you know asked around and he had some um, other conflicting priorities that he needed to take care of. So and you know you know that a guy like Brett who has invested so much of his blood and sweat if he can't make it like there's there's a, there's important things in people's lives beyond soccer so sorry that he couldn't be there but we got to talk to, to a lot of his friends so that was that was fun we learned a lot about brett through third parties so brett uh we can't wait to to meet you and uh, and have that interview that we're we're trying to secure so what did you uh, what did you think of the investors in the kind of the vip area uh yeah that was really interesting meeting meeting a lot of those guys and talking to them wasn't he actually watching ipswich and why he was exhausted i think that's why he no i think he had just come back from ipswich because they actually i'm pretty sure they had like just played a game uh i i saw a highlight on online of some like ridiculous travella goal that someone scored from from ipswich that was like amazing I I know that Ipswich got brought up in part of his travel plans and like what he needed to do, but I know that it was also, um, it was more than just soccer things that he was trying uh, to get across. So I'm, I see, you know, I mean, when football is life, the, there's always going to be a moment where you have to do something or the other, right? Um, but no, it was it was a really good time. Lots of supportive fans as we introduced ourselves. I was actually happy at the amount of people who knew us. You know, they knew us as, oh, you're those podcast guys. So I'll take that. <laughs> you know, the name can come later. I will say, oh, and uh, Christmas sweater update, since you're wearing yours right now to spite me, by the way. Spite? Um, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I still don't have my Christmas sweater. So the club <laughs> is working on fixing that. But um, they also threw some shade my way because when they fixed it the first time, they sent me a size smaller than I am. Which only tells me that they, they just think that I need to lose some weight. So I, I need to start working on. That might be my January resolutions to fit into the size they originally gave me. But the best part was, is after they tried to fix it once, they then like overnighted another one to personally hand deliver me so I could wear it at the event. And I only went to the event in a polo. Like I did not have because I was expecting to be able to warm up with this sweater. It was the same size sweater again. So they were just doubling down that you really should lose some weight, Matt. And uh, so I, I sat there all night. I wanted to hang out with the Defiance 36 guys outside and the kind of spillover, but it was just too cold for me and I, I couldn't do it. So that's why I kept like going between the VIP room and, and the, the main hallway because I just couldn't I couldn't cut it out there without a Christmas sweater. So <laughs> the club's been really great. They're working through it and I'm, I'm sure I'll get it in the next couple of days. But uh, the saga of my Christmas sweater continues. Yeah, you'll get it soon enough. Hopefully poor Christmas. <laughs> hopefully hopefully it doesn't make its way around to to Connecticut again, because if not, you're never gonna see that again. So fun fact about that, a lot of listeners after we told that story, they started tracking their own products that they've been ordering. And it looks like everything that gets mailed in Rhode Island first routes to Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh I maybe that's their main hub to move mail. But like in classic government fashion, that just feels terribly inefficient that you can't move a parcel 20 feet or 10 miles between each other it has to go 80 miles to the to the northwest first to get sorted and assimilated and then moved you know 80 miles back to the southeast to to get into the hands of the person i i mean i'm like i don't know logistics like that but our mail is never staying just in rhode island we may stay in rhode island but our mail is not <laughs> our mail definitely goes 12 minutes farther than we do <laughs> <laughs> So let's jump into these kits. Uh, like like we said, you know the the energy kit or the the blue the navy blue kit that was announced at at the Breeze conference. 
um, was kind of the first one, and a lot of people knew about that. I I love it. I I I love the fact that if you think about when you stare at that kit, you've been seeing that. If you if you pay attention to social media, you've been seeing that branding for a year now, because it incorporated a lot of the design elements that you already see in all their social posts with the lightning bolts. You know the ones in the the actual logo itself, uh, the color cues, like. It's both not surprising to see that, but it's also completely refreshing and surprising to see it all the same. I I think the kit is is a classic design. It's amazing. I think it's just enough of a unique kit that it won't look like anything else on the market. And uh, I'm a big fan. What did you think of the uh, energy kit? Yeah, I really like it. Um, and yeah, I, I I did notice that you can see a lot of the designs in uh, some of the press releases and whatnot that the club has been using i'd be curious what the story is behind that if if it so it was developed by capelli sport were they inspired by that or like how long has this been working on um maybe we'll just have to ask someone when we get a chance to see if they uh can give us some more details on that i agree i think the only two shockers that i had when i because we got to see the kit up in person in the vip room we didn't get to see the away one right away, but or the road kit, excuse me. But um, what I thought was really fascinating about the energy kit, there was two things. One, I didn't realize how big the Rhode Island energy logo on the back was. We had speculated it would be a lot smaller than that. And that thing is loud and proud on the back of the kit, like almost the size of where I would imagine someone's lettering would go. So that was a bit of an interesting piece to me. Um, but the other thing, and it's just a complete aesthetic issue for me, and I hope this doesn't like deter people, is the Breeze arrow above the, the logo for Breeze. It's a diagonal check mark that doesn't run perfectly in a line with the main center striking white lightning bolt that goes through the crest. And so it's just like, it creates this little bit of like a wobble in the diagonal line. And like, if they had just moved the checker or maybe like off-centered the Breeze logo by an inch it would have perfectly lined up I, I you can't do anything about that right it's the sponsor's logo it's the sponsor's brand with your own design but it's just that one little detail was like mm, i i would have done something i would have figured one last thing out to complement the breeze logo a little bit better but other than that like if that's my only critique i'm still gonna get that kit like i don't want anyone to think that that's a a, a deal breaker for me so then let's get to the road kit because the road kit was technically the big surprise of the night, right? It was the darling of um, of the event. What did you uh, what did you think of the road kit? I uh, was pleasantly surprised by the road kit. I, honestly, I, I think I like it better. Like crazy talk, but I, I really, really like it. A lot of people said to us at the event and online that the road kit is the better of the two. Um, some were saying, why isn't the road kit the home kit? Um, there's probably some league machinations that exist as to what colors you can play at home. Uh, some of the people that we talked to that work for the club said that the road kit felt more like the, the inspiration for the club with all of the connections to community. And, you know, it, it, it is what it is, but I agree. I, I think the road kit is the superior one. I love the aesthetic. I love all of the connections. Like I said, to the community, I even like the, the button on the top like huge fan of like yeah, that classic I, kind of throwback the details in this kit are really nice um i also am that kind of crazy person who loves like away kits and third kits because throughout the years the home kit is going to mostly be various versions of kind of the same thing uh some clubs will also kind of recycle their away kits but you know hopefully we see some different variations so that's just what i really enjoy about those other kits it's just like that like they're more fun with them maybe home kits are always great nice safe like this is this is who we are this is our colors this is our team but when it comes to away kits and third kits i i feel like they um they tend to have a little more creative freedom with them and can be more expressive sometimes they can just be absolute ridiculousness and it doesn't land but i i always appreciate the effort when they try and and do something and i think rfc really nailed it with these with these road kits i i agree i again going back to the energy kit for a second you know if that if that lightning bolt had been a sash just with the nautical tie-ins and, and themes that, that would have been amazing but but back to the road kit i i agree with you 100 it is the superior kit 
I think everyone probably feels that way. Um, I will buy both. I'm hoping the club gets us one of them for, you know, for, for us. I, I, they have not promised anything, but I'm hoping that's like at least one perk of doing this. Um, <laughs> which we can, you know, my size club and you can find out or look what I ordered for Jason for the Christmas sweater if you need sizes. But having said that, I will probably wear the Navy energy kit more because I tend to spill things on myself at events. <laughs> like at home, it's not a problem. But for whatever reason, you put me out in the wild and someone, if I don't do it, someone spills something on me um, and a bright yellow or sorry, I'm, I've been corrected many times. I have to say the word amber, a bright amber kit is going to be a stain magnet for me. And I just don't want to see that get ruined. Whereas, you know, with a, with a Navy kit, you can, you can hide some of those mistakes a little bit easier. So I'll have both, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see me rocking the, uh, the Navy more often. It'll be a special treat when you see me bring out the Amber. You'll just have to get one of those like clear, invisible, um, like, uh, Barca things just put over you at all times. Just wrap myself in a clear poncho at all times. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Love it. Love it. Um, so interesting. So just some updates on the kit real fast before we move on from the uh from the event itself. Um, there is customization coming, so the club isn't ready to commit to which day that the customization will go live, but they have said that it should be available before the deadline of 1214. Um, in order for you to take advantage of the holiday sales that are for, you know, like the spend 175, get 25 as a gift card back. Um, so that customization is coming for those of you that have been holding off and waiting. Um, and the other interesting thing that is worth mentioning is one of the cool things coming with the customization is the club has gone out of their way to secure um, special coloring for the letters and numbers. So rather than it just be a white uh, backing, which is like 99% of the world, they're doing blue and amber lettering. So it'll be opposite the color. So blue lettering for the amber kit and amber lettering for the the navy blue kit, um, which is how they'll do those customizations. So that is super cool and unique. I don't know that a lot of clubs do that. It's usually just black or white. So that's really exciting to see. And uh, so if you're waiting for that, you know, I don't have the official date, but we have heard the confirmation that they should be available just in time for that 1214. So check every day. We'll try to drop on social media when the customization is live on the website, and then we'll go from there. In fact, I was at the front office today, and now that I think about it, they didn't have a kit waiting for me. They didn't even have my Christmas sweater waiting for me, so I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Um, So it it's showing you can get personalized on their website. I just don't know if what the turnaround would be on this right now. So the turnaround is not going to make it before the holidays. Um, and then the Amber kits, that's also a great call out. The Amber kits are only pre-order. Someone, someone ordered and it was like, wait, this isn't going to drop for me for like another month and a half. But yeah. So right now they're only in pre-order mode. Just keep that in mind. If you want something as a tangible gift for a loved one, it is just the energy kit with no customization before Christmas. And speaking of um, merch and delivery dates before Christmas, we had a ton of orders on the store shop over this week, thanks in part to you being a, a spokesperson. Several people came and asked about the hat you were wearing. In fact, I think we got like eight orders for the hat online, eight or nine. Nice. So yeah, so continue to be a great model over there jason but i do want to say for anyone that is considering ordering any of the merch and you're, and you're new to um to the podcast uh the window for things to make it to you before the uh, holidays and christmas time i think that window is going to close this sunday from the last uh email i got from the account so uh, if you want something again to have as a gift uh just get those orders in before december 9th and uh you know if you want it to be after christmas just buy stuff anyway. So that's that's my shameless self-promotion plug for the for the evening. You ready to get into uh, some player signings? Yep, let's do it. So speaking of player signings and and the event itself, the big surprise of the night, uh we had several the players that we already know about at the event. The the player that was the surprise or the or the special guest of the night uh was JJ Williams. So we signed uh JJ Williams from Tampa Bay Rowdies. Uh, as a as a striker for the club, our first technical striker, right? We've had attacking minded players signed with with Mark uh, and Prince, and which we'll say in a second. But but JJ is our through and through number nine. He's our he's our target man. He's our front and center striker. And what I thought was really interesting is a couple of things. One 
is we did not pick him up in free agency. We went and secured a transfer for an undisclosed fee from Tampa Bay. And from what I've read in the league, while that does happen, it is not the common way that the clubs go about securing talent. So the fact that we went out and, you know, actively recruited and, and for all intent and purpose stole him from Tampa Bay, that speaks volumes. And then on top of that, and I haven't been able to confirm this, but I'm going off of USL tactics, he's been signed to a multi year deal. So there th- this man, JJ Williams, is is in the long-term plans for for growth of the club and for success. Um, he's a 25-year-old striker, and he's like I said, he's joining after his time with Tampa Bay, but he's also spent um, several of his seasons playing in other teams for the league, such as Phoenix, Tulsa, and then Birmingham Legion, where, of course, he spent time playing under, you know, our coach uh, when he was there as an assistant. So there's, you know, he's, he's a journeyman. He's seen different operations within the league, and coaches have been very up, front and personal um, in watching J.J. Williams grow as an attacking player and as a striker. J.J.'s got over 8,000 minutes in the league uh, combined with all, you know, scoring or excuse me, with all minutes played in all of his teams. And he's coming off the best season of his career by far this last season after having scored 13 goals and 10 assists with Tampa Bay in 2023. So he hit the double digits on both indexes in 2023. That is not something a lot of players do. They're either goal production or they are assist production. It is rare in leagues like this to see someone put up double digits across both of those avenues. Yeah, it's really impressive. Um, considering that you spent some time with Coach Kano, I wonder, you, like, you were talking about paying a, a fee to get him, and it's not something that happens. I wonder if this is something Coach Kano was like, hey, get me this guy. I, it ha- I mean, it has to be, right? Because... If you're going to spend money to acquire, that's money that you're not spending in a contract, which means you could, whether it's $10,000 or $200,000, that's more money that you could have invested in a top candidate uh, from another club in free agency or in recruiting for your international slots. So the fact that they were willing to spend more just to have the rights to bring him over uh, it speaks volumes to the coach's belief in J.J. Williams' abilities. And speaking of those abilities, you know, he is, he's super strong. And he, he was like, he was in that room and I'm a big guy and he was physically dominating the room with his presence. And after watching his highlight type, uh, his highlight tapes, the man is just lethal. He's hyper lethal in the air. I don't, I don't think there's another player in the USL championship that has a better aerial mastery than J.J. Williams currently playing in the league. Yeah, I watched some highlights of him too, and he definitely seems to uh, have some good positioning, be strong, physical, and with those 10 assists, I mean, he seems to be an unselfish player too, which is which is huge. Right, and so like when you think about, and, and we'll talk about the formation in a bit, but when you think about the play style with the likes of Mark Doyle and, and Prince Sadie, it, it, it seems like if we can't create something on the ground, we have this default backup option of scream down the flanks and just float something in the air because who's going to stop a player like J.J. Williams um, from putting up easily 12, 12 additional goals in 2024, right? Like, I, I would be shocked if he's not in the top five for the golden boot based on what kind of what kind of team Coach Kano is building right now. Exactly. And uh, like you had mentioned, signed another player, which was announced last Friday when our pod went up. So it was a little... so frustrating. We knew the name and we couldn't talk about it. There's actually so much stuff happened that I, for a split second, forgot. Like... <laughs> but yeah, so we signed Prince Sadie from Hartford Athletic. He's 30 years old, an attacking player. Um, it seems like he prefers to play on the right. Last year, Tab Ramos was trying some like center forward type of stuff, but did not seem to be a good fit for him. Um, he's played on, he's also played on the left as well, too, but the right wing is definitely his preferred and natural position. He was a Liberian national team player at this point. It looks like now that he's getting up there in age, he has retired from them, but he has seen some action, uh, in the international field. Combine that with, uh, J.J. Williams and then Doyle, I think we got a really good front three there. Yeah, I, it's it's so great that you brought up the the, the Tab Ramos experiment. I similar to what we were talking about with uh, with Connor, 
it it seems like every player that came from, through the Hartford system last year, except for maybe their keeper, just didn't play their assigned roles. And when I started looking at the numbers, I mean, he also put up double digits in his own goal production. But like you said, none of them, I think one came from his time spent as a center forward. And he spent half of the season in a through and through striker role. So the fact that as soon as he was able to play his more natural and comfortable positions, whether that's as a right wing, a left wing or a right mid, uh, suddenly he can put up, you know, nine extra goals in the season. So I, uh, I, I think, you know, if coach is paying attention and doing his homework, hopefully we don't see that kind of thing happen with players that don't seem comfortable. Um, but then also making sure that, you know, Prince seems like he's successful when he has the right players around him. And as a right wing with Connor there, again, there's a perfect symmetry and an ability for the two to, um, to play together. I actually got a chance to talk to Connor at the event and uh, he had mentioned that um, he's getting his logistics set up and his housing from the club and, and he thinks uh, that Prince and him will be sharing a, a space together. So again, more Hartford connections there and more comfortable comfortability and familiarity. They've actually already shared spaces together in the past. So it's just one of those kind of perfect combinations. Um, I also want to say before I let you talk again, for the record, when I went to Hartford to watch the El Paso game, I, I I had talked with the coach for a bit and he had asked me who I would sign having you know been there and watching the game. I told him to sign Prince and he said, mm, maybe we'll do that. Maybe we won't. I had no idea that uh, Prince, you may actually only be on the squad because of my recommendation. So <laughs> when we get a chance to talk, let's, let's find out if there's any truth to that. <laughs> I, I like, I like you taking credit for that. <laughs> I mean, coach is a great poker face. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I mean, we've asked him a bunch of questions and he just looks at us and is like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any final thoughts on, uh, on Prince City? Um, that one team he played for Barrick or Barack Young Controllers FC, such a ridiculous name. What a name. I, just, just a great name for does, a team. Does that strike you as like, like when we were doing the research for the U.S. Open Cup, um, history pod, which was like episode two, again, listeners go back, listen to it. A lot of the team names that were created back in that day were just like company t- team names, like. FC Whalers Incorporated. Do you think this is a like a historical callback or throwback to some company that was named that? Like I have no understanding of what this name is. Possibly I didn't look into it myself. I almost wonder too though if it's like a English second language thing where I this was a, a Liberian team. So it's like if you just put some random English words together and just make us a cool sounding team. I don't know. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, let's keep moving on because, again, we're still not done with player signings. So last but not least, we've got one additional signing which came out today. And speaking of a Hartford connection, uh, the club was proud to announce that they were able to sign 24-year-old Joe Brito, uh, who's joining Rhode Island FC from the Union Omaha and USL1. Now, the Hartford connection here is he's a native of Hartford, Connecticut. So when we get to sit down with him, we're going to have to have a long conversation on what the best Neapolitan pizza is because we couldn't figure that out when we spent that time down there. It seemed like it was a very uh, conflicting question to ask the population. They, they didn't seem like they could consolidate, like they couldn't consolidate into one answer on what the true best pizza was. But having said that, we're really excited that he's able to join. I, I got to watch uh, a lot of his highlight tape today in between some work. You know, as a midfielder, it's really interesting. He was they were in USL one with the with the Union Omaha, and you know he as a midfielder was playing the lion's share of minutes with the Union. Um, but I didn't know that the Union were they won the league in terms of a quote unquote standard um, you know rankings and and winning in in the standings perspective. They they took first place, and more so they took first place over a club that's rejoining the championship in North Carolina FC. So, you know, when we talk about that parody about pro rel, they just beat out a club that is rejoining to play us next year. And uh, so for anyone that's thinking, oh, Gary, we, we picked up someone from USL one, they must not be that great of a quality. I beg to differ. Joe Brito seems like he has everything and more to bring to the table when it comes to competing um, for, for hardware with Rhode Island FC. And in fact, the, the, 
the Union only got knocked out in the semifinals by Charlotte Independence on penalties. So it wasn't even like they got blown out. It came down to a game of, you know, 50-50 chance where, you know, nerves are, are what they are. And ironically, with we talk about them losing to Charlotte, Brito played for the University of North Carolina in Charlotte for his entire collegiate career. So it must have been a really bittersweet moment to kind of have all of those things come to fruition. But the final piece that I want to talk about before I hand the mic over is, you know, we saw the connection with J.J. Williams uh, having played for Coach Cano before. Here's another similar experience where Brito, much like uh, Amos, played with the Revs uh, Youth Academy, where, surprise, Coach Cano was also there too. So it seems like as Coach has been building this roster, he has been relying a lot on the positions and the people he's been investing in for four five, 10 years as this thought experiment, you know, and, and, and to me, that tells me like, you know, you keeping track of players that have talent and finding them later in life is a really good skill because he didn't pick up Joe last season when he was with Birmingham. He didn't pick up Amos last season when he was with Birmingham. It's almost as if he knew that these were players that he could handpick in his arsenal should he ever be given the chance to create his own roster, which is here where we are now. Possibly. Uh, I, I also wonder if, if um, you know, if Coach is maybe not that much of a mastermind and you kind of lean in on your your colleagues and the people that you know and have met. Um, I definitely think some of them, like J.J. Williams, he's he definitely is like, I want this guy. A lot of them maybe too. Some, some of them, I should say, might just come down to, like I said, just knowing, you know, who you know, your connections. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. But, you know, at the same time, if you look at Coach's time spent in any of his coaching across any of his last 10 years, I mean, he's been exposed to or has seen thousands of soccer players. And I'm sure of those thousand, maybe 30 have truly made it if they're you know and that are actively playing so i there's I, a part of me that agrees with that but there's also a part of me that's like he's still choosing from the pick of the litter so to speak on those players that he wants to bring in right it's not just strictly convenience or you know i'm picking the guys that you know i i'm comfortable with picking yeah sorry i i should clarify i don't mean that it's just like oh i know this guy i'll get him i guess it's like some of these people that he's met probably made an impression on him for him to remember them um it's not like he's just picking names out of a hat of people that he knows i just mean like i don't know if he's got the whole charlie thing on the wall with all the the dots connected like this is the the ultimate team the formation that i need you know are, what are I mean? you like, doing the is this the pepe silva <laughs> it's always sunny reference yeah like he i don't think he's got one of those on a wall somewhere where he has all these specific people he's looking for it's probably here. Here's a collection of some people that I'm interested in, some that I know, some that impressed me, and trying to find that balance of like who can who can the team actually go out and get there for him. I I would think that would track. Um, and and you know just to make sure that we get a chance to really reflect on on Joe and his his style. So. As a midfielder, um, I, I watched his highlight tape today. I don't know if you've even had a chance to see it yet. But, you know, he's not he's not a huge goal machine. And, and mid, good midfielders really, you know, shouldn't be, right? But he, in watching his highlight reels, he's not afraid to take one-on-ones going up the field, which to me can say, hey, if you're good, it really unlocks uh, parts of the defense as you're trying to, to make attacking, you know, credible attacking threats. Uh, but if you lose, that it that could put the uh, the defense in in a little bit of risk. So I'll be interested to see what that style takes on, or if, if that's a part of a possession based plan, which I think is kind of what coach looks like he's trying to build. But one thing that really struck out to me with with Joe is he's a really good pass connector, short or long. He finds angles that you know when I watch games, you know I I do that FIFA God mode where you know you're looking up. And you start screaming internally and go, why aren't you just passing that guy is open on your left or that guy is open on your right? And that, of course, is so much more difficult to translate when you're on the pitch at, at eye level. And Joe, in, in the highlight reel alone, he was he was making, he was threading passes that I wasn't seeing, having that higher view perspective. So when a player has that kind of vision, 
Um, that's always exciting soccer to watch, and it'll be interesting to see what that kind of unlocks um, in terms of goal scoring opportunities. Yeah, um, someone needs to get the ball to those forwards. So I think that uh, you know if he is good at successful one on ones, take ons can can beat a man and then find that pass so he can get the ball out to Sadie or get the ball to Doyle. Or maybe even in some cases, J.J. Williams. Um, in some of the highlights I've seen, he he will drop back into the mid. And at times he may float left or right. So I don't know how how static that front three will be. But yeah, you really need someone to connect that midfield to the attack. Because as great as that attacking line that we have seems to be, if we can't get the ball to him, we can't score. Agreed. So let's let's switch gears here now that we've gotten through those announcements and, and we actually have the start of an almost complete team for listeners. You can generate it of formation in any of those apps that exist uh, on your phone or on, on desktops. But you kind of started experimenting based on transfer market history and what we know that like the club has announced in terms of role and position. What uh what is the formation kind of currently looking like? Uh so I'm going off the assumption that Coach is probably going to play a four three three. Um, so yeah, I just I I looked up our signings here, put everyone in. So we've got, you know we've got Koke in the net. We've got Grant Stoneman in front of him. Um, we still need a left and right fullback, and then another center back. Um, I'm I'm also going off the assumption that the people we've signed so far, I'm <laughs> just putting them in the, on the field. Um, we've got Connor McGlynn, Joe Brito, and Amos Shapiro Thompson in the midfield. And who, then, who do you have listed in the central mid spot of that formation? I went Is it with, Connor. I went with Connor because so I, I I looked at um I don't know Amos Shapiro Thompson's preferred position, but Joe Brito prefers to play on the left of the midfield, not like a winger, but like the left of let's say a three or maybe a four, depending on on what the how the how the team would line up so then you would have mark doyle up in front of him jj williams up top and then prince sadie out on the right wing interesting you don't think that i mean not that like you have to be right under a player to make it work but you don't think that connor would be more of a right mid to to couple and partner with with prince as he has in the past i think most likely that's where he'll play um, I was just kind of throwing the names out there for right now. Um, I think realistically, this um, this lineup is probably a little too attacking. I imagine Coach probably wants, if, if we're going to play a three, you probably need one solid midfielder who you would consider your like defensive midfielder. So I just don't think out of the people we have right now, there's there's anyone who would be that. Okay, so I, I think that's a perfect segue into some of the player rumors that we've been promising to talk about for a while. It's it's like almost not fair to say it now because it doesn't mean anything, but J.J. Williams was on our shortlist radar and tracker. Um, just didn't expect to hear. We, we had heard virtually nothing about the acquisition. Um, so kind of going through some of these other ones, uh, we'll just kind of try to educate where we think things may be and then knowing our record on getting these right it'll probably be zero percent um by the end of it but you never know so um this one's kind of i'll kick things off this one's you know bittersweet but also kind of fun um alejandro guido from the san diego loyal uh we've been telling listeners for a while that we have always heard that there were three loyal players um, in contention for um, being picked up. We knew Grant and we knew Koke. We thought it would be Camden Riley or potentially um, Renato de Moose. Uh, there was really strong inklings, inklings, excuse me, towards those players coming on board, but those those ships have sailed. I'm still a Joe Corona fanboy, but where we're starting to hear rumors because this player hasn't moved into any other spaces is uh, Alejandro Guido. And Again, the reason it makes sense is one, um, it would he he's a CDM. So to your point about uh, needing a more defensively minded player, it really links us straight up the middle of the pitch and connects Koke to Grant, and then you know now to Alejandro, um, and and so I, I like that, uh, but also too, and and it sounds like you may kind of have a different opinion here. 
but I'm not sure how much more we'll stack a four three three. Um, if like I, I almost need to know where Connor will be playing because Connor's definitely going to be a starter for us, and at his height and at his skill set in a four three three, if he's truly playing central what does that mean like does he go out to the wing so that we have a more like defensive shaped six i i don't i don't know most likely he he'll play on on the right of a three okay especially because he'll 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 line up right behind prince sadie because they'll have that connection i i don't disagree but again it's you know, if this was a four four two, I could say this makes sense right away. In a four three three, there's so many different methodologies you can play. That's I, I think that's probably why four three threes have been so widely adopted is they're so versatile. The 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 standard is the the one midfielder who sits in front of your two center backs tends to be your defensive midfielder, and then the two on the left and the right of them can kind of depending on how you want to play. One could be more more attacking. They could just be too like you know, standard central midfielders who play box to box. There is, you know, and then sometimes people get crazy and they're just like, we don't need a holding midfielder. <laughs> they just throw a cam in there. I've seen where you actually have this, the middle of the three push up and the other two can kind of sit back. So it, it just depends on coach's style and how he wants to play. And then also, you know, as as we are right now, we don't have a full lineup, so it's harder for us to kind of predict. You know, some of these people might not be starters all the time. I think most of the ones we have so far will be, but just not 100% sure. You know, I didn't mention this during the event part, and I, I almost wanted to just take a pause and just talk about it. We, we did talk to all of the players, like I mentioned, um, as they did their fashion runway model, um, which was such a cool thing, like not only for the players to – to do it but then there was community members um and kids that got to to strut and and walk the walk and and wear the kit with pride so that was really cool um when we ran into amos uh and his family really great people amos is a really down-to-earth guy you know he had he had said hey you guys were fair about describing you know what was going on i had some injuries that you know they, they don't really cover as much in like things like the New York Red Bulls too and and in his collegiate time. So he'd explain that. I, I don't know to your point if signings like Joe and Amos are like strong depth pieces and like rotational for 35 minutes or 45 minutes a game. From their highlight reels, they look like they're ready to play day one and, and go, you know, the full 90. So you're right. We, we don't know where that rest of that investment will be. I, I just am scared to to pin anyone to anything right now until we see the rest of the of the 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 players that we need we have vacancies in kind of fill those roles i think the only thing we know for sure is we know coke will start and we know that the front three seem to be locked in um with with that doyle williams and and prince uh combination so you're absolutely right. it's just speculation now and uh i think there's some really interesting speculation coming out of the new england revolution it looks like um for for players that locals and and listeners have been praying and hoping would join the squad but I I think you've got some bad news for him. <laughs> yeah, so we've also heard some rumors here about a center forward Justin Renix. Um so he was just released uh like a week ago, I think. Out of, his contract was not picked up by the Revs. Yeah, and so looks like he signed with Finnish side AC Olu. So uh Sorry, guys, that one is not happening for, for all the Rennick heads out there that thought we would be picking him up. There, there's been speculation that he would go to a USLC side to to get some more polish because he just he never he never made it on to the, the Revs, um, you know, pitch. He just he couldn't penetrate that first team with consistent minutes. Um, I wouldn't have minded Rennick, but literally, I think the announcement came or the discussion came right after. J.J. Williams was signing. I'll take J.J. Williams any day of the week. Yeah, and then we got another one here, a left winger, Damian Rivera. Tico. Um, He's young. He spent some time under Kano in the academy, um, not getting a lot of playing time, so it's possible. Um, But at the same time, um, looks like he's just re-signed with the Revs, so that would probably require a fee. 
So, no, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't buy him if if yeah. If, so that's what I mean. Is is if he, you know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say never. I mean, there are mechanics in place within the USL and MLS that if if the revolution are to me, the revs are probably picking him up because he has so much potential, but they don't know how to use him, and there's not enough. There's not enough space in the current revs lineup to make use of him. So it's like one of those investments in the future. I don't think he'll stay with the revolution. I think he will get loaned out somewhere to get minutes. I just, and it would make sense, right? To like send him to your quote unquote little brother down the the way where he's from Rhode Island. He's a Rhode Island hometown hero. Uh, he gets playing time, but we, we just picked up Mark Doyle. And he's a left winger. We signed one. We used one of our internationals. We probably splashed some cash to pick up Mark. I I don't know if that is feasible because because if you're gonna if you're a big team and you're sending someone somewhere, your main objective is minutes at that point, right? And to offload the payroll, which I don't think I don't think he's making a ton of um, money with the with. But I I also have never looked it up. I just don't know if that means that we could bring him on. Yeah, it would have to be a loan. And I guess, like you said, he he's he seems to have a, have a lot of talent and maybe he just needs to develop in the right way. So probably would want to go somewhere where he would be, be the guy to get the playing time. You think he'd want to be the guy or just get the reps? Because um, he'd want to be the guy with the revolution, right? He wouldn't want to be the guy. Well, sir, when, when I say be the guy, like he, he wants to be the guy who is nailed on to the starting 11 got it yep no so at at rfc i don't think he, he'd be that guy would you if you couldn't make it in first team with division one and you you just wanted to play would you would you take the hit and go down and be you know a, a god tier usl championship player um i think there there's um there's merit in that you can um also like develop your yourself further um like i'd I'd rather be playing than not playing i think that uh, that is spoken perfectly <laughs> i'd rather have the minutes and be able to say i accomplished something i agree so yeah so sorry revs fans but i right now would i say that we're not going to get any revolution spill off no but the players that everyone was hoping for would be joining the the amber and blue it does not look like uh, those key roles will be will be coming in house, but hey, maybe maybe we're wrong about everything. Uh, well, we're not wrong about Justin; he's definitely signed a contract. <laughs> but <laughs> I think we got a that there was a whole tire fire mess going on over there. They're restructuring some of the front office. I would think that any movement that come from them, like even like just a loan, we might have to wait till mid season before anything like that happens. Because I don't know if they, depending on what what the new people in place there want they they're gonna kind of try and give everyone an opportunity and kind of figure out what they're doing over there you know it's weird that you say that because you're right there's they are in a front office rebuild but a lot of their players are at least on like the senior roster are kind of carryovers they're coming back there's only a handful of ones that that really truly got cut um but I agree with you because of the way MLS works and it's it's craziness and having to match talent with the rest of the world. They may not see additions or acquisitions until the summer, which is when they may need to offload a player. So we may see revolution reinforcements uh, come midseason for us. We, we, we don't know, but who, let's we'll find out together. So kind of to capstone on the rumors that we wanted to go over for a while, uh, we wanted to finish off with uh, Birmingham Legion updates. So, you know, again, coach just recently came from the Legion. So we've been waiting to understand who they would be releasing from contract at the end of the season. Uh, and there was a lot of names. There was a lot of people that uh, had been let go. And uh, there's a couple of players that we've been tracking since then. And uh, all signs seem to point that we'll at least be picking up this next player, Gabriel Alves, uh, who is a fullback, predominantly uh, at the left back position. It, it, it seems like the club has already signed him. There were multiple players in the organization who started following him on Instagram. And so I, I think like every player that has been signed, like started liking him uh, and following him. 
So this may be one of the best, the most poorly kept secrets uh, that the club has has done so far. Uh, in that regard, uh, it makes sense. It's a position of need. We don't have any fullbacks yet. Kano would know him intimately from his time playing uh, under him. And I, I really can't think of a reason this doesn't make sense. In fact, I'm almost, I would be disappointed at this point if we didn't pull the trigger and, and pick him up uh, unless it comes down to money or contract negotiations, you know, those things that kind of can get in the way of themselves. For all intent and purpose, I believe we've already signed Gabriel Alves and uh, that's that's where I stand on it. Do you think that that would be anything different in your mind? No, I mean, maybe unless it's some sort of weird recruitment policy where they just get everyone in the club to like him. <laughs> and they're like, those guys are really nice over there. I should go hang out with them. So it's like reverse peer pressure. I love it. I love it. And uh, and so while we weren't tracking uh, Gabriel originally, our, our money had been on Anderson Asidu. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to the conversation we had a minute ago with the with Alejandro Guido in, at the Loyal. Uh, he is a very aggressive defensive midfielder. I was watching his highlight tapes a couple of weeks ago, and he like the physicality of him and like his like reliance to show up on a ball and just strip it away from you, his tackling, um, his positioning, just a really great player to have from a defensive minded standpoint. Uh, I, I thought we were going to pick this player up, and then, I, I, and this is all unconfirmed. We we it could be unsub, unsubstantiated as well, but we've heard that there's been some problems with Anderson uh, at Birmingham that existed before he was out of contract at the end of the season. He wasn't getting dressed. He wasn't getting minutes. Um, there were rumors that like he was not playing anymore for the club. Don't know if that was because he had already signed a contract with another team, and he just didn't want to play for the club anymore. Don't know if there were um, there were issues with him. Someone came in our Discord and again not vetted, but said that he has had locker room problems in the past. I don't know if any of that's true, but I do know that if coach saw something, you know, I would trust coach's opinion on how to manage and and inspire a player like Anderson to play for us. Um, so he's the ultimate authority on making those decisions. But I, I don't know if any of that's true. I would love to see a player like that join, especially if coach has the faith that he can deliver. Um, but if he's someone that would be, you know, not ideal and at the same time, like let's just make sure we do what's right for the club at that point. Uh, but yeah, yeah, those are, those are kind of the rumors. That's what we've been standing on for a while. Uh, there's a couple other names that are shortlisted, but these are the ones right now that people are talking about that kind of make sense. So we'll see more what happens. And then I guess I would also just throw in, I'm still in the camp of Lucas Burns joining us as a, as a third, second or third backup goalkeeper. So I, I, I still think that that's something we'll also see. Any, any final thoughts or opinions? Yeah. Uh, I, I, these are some good players. I, I think that uh, we really want to lock down that holding midfielder position, but at the same time, you know, we fullbacks are important as well too. Probably the most important role in a in a four three three because they they probably have to work the hardest. It, it just depends on on the the playing style. I mean, even even a four three three can look vastly different depending on the tactics employed. Yeah. So, uh, how about some listener questions? All right. So we got a few here. Um, Aaron B wants to know: uh, Do you know if there will be a keeper kit or third kit coming? Yeah, so this is a great question. We we confirmed earlier. I think we shared a little bit last week. Um, there, will, I mean, Koke will have his own keeper kit, but uh, at this time, there is no intent or plan to release a goalkeeper kit for sale. Um, and that that seems kind of polarizing, considering our first ever player in in the history of signing with Rhode Island FC was a goalkeeper. But it it looks like, and if you look around the league, a lot of clubs don't sell the keeper kits. It, it's just maybe that's not a thing that's caught on in America. I don't know, Jason, you're much more familiar with, with kits and whatnot than I am. Is that something you've seen in your day to day that you see people wearing, you know, manual Neuer kits from, you know, 2009? I mean, I've been to quite a few soccer games in the States here and I feel like I've seen a few, not a lot, but there's always that one guy who's maybe a little, Got a few screws loose, you know, a little unhinged. He's got a goalkeeper kit. So the the keeper kits are for the crazies. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't count 
your chickens on a keeper kit being available what you should really do is is come to the games and then at the end of a game find coke and just ask him to take the kid off his back and then if you're not that size like me you need to work down to the size you want to be and uh then you know wear that kit when you fit in it that's it's pretty straightforward or if there's enough other of you out there who want a uh, keeper kit maybe rfc could be the first team to sell one let them know so lose weight or find 3,999 friends who all want the same thing. <laughs> Got it. I mean, I don't know if they need to buy that many, but if, you know, a substantial amount of people voice their concern that they would like to purchase a keeper kit, I, the club, you know, just might do that for them. It's not not crazy. Uh, and then in regard to the third kit, I, I love that you're already asking for the next new kit. Um the, the club has not committed that there's any intent right now. Um, they'll probably reassess that come summertime um, or if like a sponsorship deal falls into their laps to do something creative like that. Um, I checked again with other clubs in the league and usually two and then there's like a special uh, really limited release thing that happens. So maybe that's a third kit or a community kit option. Um, I don't know when we'll see one, but I do hope that for one of the future kits, especially third, that they release like some sort of challenge to the community to design it. I really love when it's when that third kit comes from the fans uh, versus any other kind of designer and stuff like that. And I think there's enough design fo- uh, focused people in Rhode Island that we could probably come up with some really creative and cool things um, on our own. Yeah, or that may be some sort of mid-season collaboration with some local businesses or something fun. Yeah, no, I agree. What else we got? All right. Zach wants to know if these contracts are only one-year deals. So um, great, great question, and we kind of already talked about it. In fact, this question was what made me even add it earlier, so I should have just saved it so Zach looked like a smarter person. But yeah, most contracts in the USL are free a single year sometimes with a club option to uh extend by another year or two but uh, most of them are one year contracts before free agency again we do know that JJ Williams is in some sort of multi-year deal we haven't we haven't confirmed it but we know that that's out there and then also Koke um it's more than likely as the marquee signing and, and for a keeper unless you're just having a really bad year it's more than likely he's on a two to three year deal himself um, because that's someone you build around and uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but we will probably never know for sure because the league isn't required to announce those things. So unless the club graciously tells us what that is, um, which they don't have any need to, um, I don't know that we'll, we'll ever really get to the bottom of that. But if we see big name marquee players and especially if we go out and buy them and they're not in free agency, I would imagine there's a little bit more investment to them than just a single year. Do you, do you think anything differently on that? Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, unless we're splashing the cash on a player, it's probably only one year. Everyone else in the league is doing it. So unless something changes, maybe at the next CBA meeting that they have, you know, as the league grows, that might be something in the future we see change. But for now, it, I think it's pretty safe to assume that everyone is just on a one-year deal. Yep. Any other questions? All right, we got another one here from Justine. Met you guys at the event. When is the schedule coming out? Anchors up. I, I love that Justine wrote anchors up in the comment. Um, that I think that's a first. So first time nice. listener and new already to report in. I, you know, I love it. Great question. Uh, the league. We reached out to the league to ask for when the like absolute maximum deadline is for releasing uh the schedules to fans and they have not gotten back to us yet but we did have some conversations with the club uh the club is due a mostly finalized draft in the next couple of days so it's thursday night right now assume they're either getting it tomorrow or by like tuesday at the latest next week so having said that you know that doesn't mean that we as fans will see it yet uh, we tried to track down the when the last schedule was released, and it was released in January for the most part to fans. So having said that, uh, we may anticipate that you won't hear about the schedule until then. That doesn't mean that's always the case. But, you know, when we talked to the club about what the delays that they were facing behind it, there's so much that goes into having to coordinate all of the games and scheduling. 
Uh, remembering too that a lot of the clubs in this league share spaces, whether it's a rental agreement to a stadium, a collegiate stadium. Uh, us ourselves, we're we're victims of that this year, having to share with Bryant University. So there's a lot of work that has to go into to not just work within the USL schedules, but all of the different leagues and events that are occurring in places where there's a co-opted space. So all we can say is sit tight. I will say that we tried to get some information out of them on, on anticipating how many games we would go as away at the beginning of the season before we saw a lockdown of that first home game. We threw out, I think, four or five at the at the Toys for Tots um event that that Cardi's had and um and they just said well you know it you'd be you may be a little surprised that you think there's that many games that go on before we get a home game so for whatever number that means uh it's not like we're gonna have a six game drought before we get you know better weather to to attend matches so they're coming uh all we can say is hang tight but I hope that the club does put together something um, for a watch party for that first game, probably at the Guild. That seems to be kind of the the unofficial HQ. Um, but I'm really excited to, to see what's going on. So yeah, so more to come. But right now, it's just all we're waiting on the USL. Yeah, I, I'm thinking really only two or three before we uh, just have to suck it up and get outside. Yeah, I mean, it's not like people players the professional players play in that weather all the time right so i i think it could be a bit of a detriment to fans that are not used to that um but also rhode island fans rhode island people are tough people they they know what weather like that is they've probably gone to revolutions game revolution games they've gone to patriots games like that that's no different right pats play all the way through if they're in the if they're in the postseason they're playing in january already anyways so it's not like they're not uh, adverse to cold weather so more to come um but really good question and and welcome to uh the re- re- welcome to being a rap fan i guess as, as they say so thanks <laughs> justine all right um and we got another one here uh super fan tim wants to know what it feels like to win defiance's first charity raffle well i technically didn't win uh it was my wife <laughs> I think they screamed collusion and we just, we didn't even know that we had won. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. Well, we did just tell them to uh to pick someone else to win because you know, why my life my wife is a great wife. You know, she will go to soccer games with me. She's she's not the biggest soccer fan. It's more of a I'm trying to be a good wife and support my husband and the thing that he makes him happy. Yeah, I mean, listen, <laughs> for the defiance group give us scarves we'll give you whatever money you need and that's all there is to it go go give that out to someone who maybe can't afford to sign up for membership but wants to to be a part of your experience so we appreciate it we promise there was no collusion uh and anyone that you know says otherwise well you needed to donate more toys we just out donated you we were better people so deal with it (laughs) Uh, we got another question from Irvin too but I think I want to sit on this one for another time I think it's a good question I just don't think i have an answer right now i'll have to think about it more we'll oh was this from like the discord live while we were yeah we we just kind of reached out okay. to, to see if anyone had any questions but we'll uh we'll save that one for another time uh we got some events here right uh looks like it yeah as a reminder define 1636 memberships are now live according to their leaders signups have been an overwhelming success find out more at ridefiant1636.org on Friday, December 15th, RAFC will return to Wadra Rail and Zoo for the Holiday Lights Festival. And then next year, Saturday, January 27th. Wow, next year's coming up, isn't it? So soon. It's so soon. Just right around the corner. RAFC is going to be at the RI Brew Fest at the Waterfire Arts Center. I cannot wait for all of that to happen. Uh, super exciting. And speaking of kind of the Holiday Lights, uh, I just want to make sure we say, because, you know, we celebrate Christmas, but not all people do. Uh, I know there's a couple of other holidays that have kicked off. So for those of you that celebrate anything and everything, uh, we just want to wish everyone that listens a happy holiday season. Um, We want to celebrate with you guys and make sure that we get a chance to wish you all the best. We couldn't do this without any of you. um, And we just really appreciate everything and all the support that you guys give. So Happy holidays to anyone and everyone that's already started their their holiday season there. And uh, 
Jason, let's uh let's wrap this up. All right, guys. Yeah, thank you for everything. Wishing you all the best. Um, if you want to check us out on socials, we have a Twitter, Threads, and TikTok, all at the handle R A F C Podcast. We have an Instagram at Raising Anchor, and there is a website www.raisinganchorpodcast.com uh, Anchors up, buddy. Anchors up. Can't wait to get that on a custom-made kit. Hint, hint. Can't wait to get a sweet tattoo. <laughs> <laughs>